All right. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining again uh, to uh, the next set of talks and as part of the uh, Fellows Track Symposium, um, the ATS uh, Pediatric um, uh, Pillar. Uh, we have two great speakers for you today. Uh, the first talk for, uh, is by uh, Jeff Feynman and Jeff's at University of California, San Francisco, and he's going to be talking about pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then at five o'clock, we've got uh, McGee Lee from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who's going to be speaking on uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia. The field, so we really appreciate their willingness to um, uh, give these lectures. Uh, uh, the next set of talks will be Wednesday. Uh, Sharon Dell is going to talk about lung manifestations of rheumatologic diseases. That's at four. And then at five, Chris Baker will be speaking on bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And as always, please um, help us by evaluating the uh, um, effectiveness of the activity and make any recommendations for future activities. And, and please complete the evaluations. We really do take those very seriously. And um, we uh, appreciate that. And so at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Jeff, who's going to talk to us about uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. You can either ask questions at the end or type it in the chat box. Um, and then I'll come back on the screen at the end and uh, Jeff will be happy to answer your questions. So thank you and Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to the directors. This is always a great uh, day. Unfortunately, it's virtual this year, but I appreciate the opportunity. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. And then let's see if I can figure this out. There we go. So I'm going to talk to you about pediatric pulmonary vascular disease. And first, I, ha I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this talk. Uh, the Pulmonary Hypertension Service does participate in, in many clinical trials, and some of them are industry sponsored. So that would be my only disclosure. Um, for for the rest of the hour, what I thought we'd talk about is pulmonary hypertension in terms of its definition and what the vascular phenotype is, how it's classified in the epidemiology, and focus on a couple of the more common ones that you may come across. You may be asked to see patients in, in the neonatal ICU when PPHN persists, and uh, a very common form that associated with congenital heart disease. And then close by giving you a, um, kind of an overview of the therapy options and the outcomes and hopefully end on a positive note even though this is a devastating disease that things are definitely uh, getting better. So first of all the nomenclature is problematic unfortunately. Pulmonary hypertension is defined by, by certain calculated parameters or measured parameters and so let's just go through that. So it, it, it's a, currently a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 25 millimeters of mercury at rest and greater than 30 millimeters of mercury during exercise. There is a lot of discussion about changing that definition to, to greater than 20 instead of 25 because there appears to be clinically relevant um, <clears throat> phenotypes when they have even lower uh, PA pressures. And then the calculated resistance is greater than three Woods units. The problem with the nomenclature of pulmonary hypertension as you probably all know there are patients that have clinically relevant uh, pulmonary vascular disease that they don't necessarily meet those, these criteria. For example, the emerging uh, congenital heart disease population that has single ventricle physiology, where, they, where any mild elevations in pulmonary vascular resistance or pressure can have a dramatic impact on their surgical um, course and their overall outcomes. So, those of us in the field are kind of trying to get away from the, the, the concept of saying pulmonary hypertension and either switching to pulmonary vascular disease in general or pulmonary hypertensive vascular disease. Having said that, it's both a structural disease where there's um, vascular remodeling, which I'll show you some cartoons and some pictures of. And then as you know, it's a functional disease that these blood vessels have a tremendous propensity to constrict uh, with certain certain stimuli, uh, 
such as um, hypoxia or agitation with endogenous catechols, et cetera. And they have an impaired ability to relax to certain drugs and, and, and flow and things like that. So this is just a cartoon. Let's see if I, oh, I can use this. This is a cartoon of the normal uh, blood vessel. And in many uh, etiologies of pulmonary vascular disease, there's initial endothelial injury. This can be from a toxin or it could be from abnormal mechanical forces such as with congenital heart disease. And that leads to an imbalance of, of the factors that are made by the endothelial cell. Like there's a loss of nitric oxide, a prostacyclin production, and there's an increase in endothelin and thromboxane. The endothelin and thromboxane are pulmonary vasoconstrictors and, and promote smooth muscle cell proliferation where nitric oxide and prostacyclin do the opposite. So that can initiate cascades. The next thing you see is the, the, the muscle layer, this medial layer get thick, and then, and then the, this intimal layer gets fibrotic. And as you can see, all these things narrow the lumen of the blood vessel. And then ultimately, either by uh, platelet aggregation and micro uh, thrombi and or these plexiform lesions, which are um, polyclonal uh, proliferation of endothelial cells, that you basically lose the lumen of this blood vessel. There's, um, in 1958, Heath and Edwards published an, ana an anatomic uh, description of these, these lesions with different grades. Um, and I, I bring that up not because it's really clinically useful anymore, and we'll talk about lung biopsy utility a little bit later, uh, but people do uh, characterize them sometimes as a Heath Edwards uh, scale. This is just some pictures of some severe disease Here's a, a, a lumen that's still patent, but has this medial thickness. And here you can see these lumens are completely occluded. This is a plexiform lesion, uh, but you see the medial hypertrophy and complete occlusion of these blood vessels in severe, severe disease. This is an important slide because the, the, the point of this slide is that ultimately, and the cardiologist will tell you this all the time, that ultimately this becomes a disease of right heart failure. That um, initially you have a, a cardiac output that's maintained as your pulmonary artery pressure goes up as during the disease progression, and then your calculated resistance also goes up. But with time, the RV begins to fail. So your cardiac output actually falls as you go into heart failure and pulmonary artery pressure may go up, but then starts to fall as your as your output falls significantly. And I think importantly, and this has been shown in many studies now, the survival is not based on that your PA pressure is X or your pulmonary vascular resistance is Y. It's based on how your RV responds to that afterload. And this is just one, two studies uh, showing that by echo indices, but it's also been shown that right atrial pressure and cardiac output are much more predictive of outcomes in these patients than actually calculated resistance or how high the pressure is. And that's important because we're, we're finding more and more different RV phenotypes. There are some RVs that seem to tolerate the resistance better than other RVs, and those patients do better. And why that is, I think, is an important area of investigation because as we'll talk about, all the therapies to now are really based on lowering pulmonary uh, pressures and vascular resistance, but there's really nothing that's targeting the right ventricle. And I think that's a whole area of, of a research that is being done and needs to be done that could lead to major therapeutic breakthroughs. So the pediatric symptoms are not surprisingly uh, heart failure symptoms, right? Uh, early symptoms are dyspnea, fatigue, exercise intolerance. In, in infants, it's a little more subtle, similar to the babies you've seen with the congestive heart failure. And then late symptoms could be psychosis. This is rare, leg swelling, abdominal fullness, syncope. And this particularly for the pulmonologists in the group, in the audience there, which I believe is the majority, it is not uncommon if you see a 16-year-old with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension that you can, you can write the history before you even take it. It's very, very common that they've been misdiagnosed with reactive airway disease, you know, have been on um, medicines for reactive airway disease. They've been excused from uh, 
from PE for years because of reactive airway disease, but they've never had an exacerbation of reactive airway disease that's ended up where they end up in the emergency room. But they mistreated as a reactive airway disease and then this history of them being, having more and more exercise intolerance is classic. This is a nice study um, from a few years ago now by the, the group in the Netherlands where they went to 362 patients and um, you can see that the overwhelming um, much common, most common presentation was dyspnea with exertion, um, 65%. 8% had near syncope, 20% had CKP, and 41% had uh, fatigue. Okay, and this is important. The time it gets to the whole issue of mis being misdiagnosed with reactive airway disease or other things, the time from the onset of symptoms to diagnosis was 17 months, which is really unfortunate. So here's the most recent classification. It's uh, six years old already, and it's suboptimal. It's a hodgepodge of things, but just to go over it, um, group one is pulmonary arterial hypertension, and then the big ones in here are the idiopathics, the familials, uh, drug-induced, um, congenital heart disease. Then we have one prime and one double prime, which includes persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn because no one knows what to do with them. Pulmonary venal occlusive disease or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, which may be the same thing I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, group two is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease, much more common in adults than, than children, but certainly in some congenital heart defects, left-sided uh, issues can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Group three is lung or hypoxia disorders, much more common now in the pediatric population, but COPD would be the big adult one, interstitial lung disease, sleep disordered breathings, um, high altitude. The developmental lung diseases are a big emerging one in pediatric population. And I think Chris is, is gonna be giving his talk on BPD, which is much better than anything I could say about BPD. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna omit BPD on purpose, but that's really an, uh, an emerging big population of patients that are now being recognized to have um, pulmonary vascular disease and are being treated uh, for pulmonary vascular disease. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or CTEF is associated with hypercoagulable disorders. Important to recognize because this is a very treatable form and the treatment's very different than the other forms. And then group five is just other um, related things. So if you look at the epidemiology in adults, it's easy to remember. Group one is the most common, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Group two is the second most common. And group three is the, the lung disease is the third most common. This is um, some data from the PPH network, which is 13 academic centers, pediatric centers, and our database. This was taken when we had 1,500 patients. And interestingly, you can see that group three, or the lung diseases, has really emerged as the most common um, form of pulmonary hypertension in, in the pediatric population, with group one being a close second, um, <clears throat> group two being um, much, much lower, only 4%, and then group four, CTAP, very unusual, group five, 2.8%. So very different epidemiology with the adults. Just briefly, some of the issues related to the pathobiology. This is really to remind you that this is a spectrum of disease, right? We say pulmonary hypertension and we treat it like they're all the same, um, which is unfortunate, but we really, it's a spectrum of disease with different pathobiologies and, and ultimately should have probably different therapies. Uh, these are just some of the potential uh, etiologies that we know about endothelial injury with the toxins for sure, with congenital heart disease for sure, inflammation certainly related to HIV and may, other infectious disease related um, etiologies. Altered metabolism is being well recognized now as an issue. Coagulation disorders certainly with CTEF, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to talk a little bit about the growing emergence of, um, of genetic predispositions in, in this because this has really become helpful in making a diagnosis and guiding therapy. And ultimately, I think this is where we, need, we really need to get to individualized therapy. So 
this is uh, old data, but it, it gets to the point that these patients really, really need to be uh, evaluated thorough, thoroughly. And we, we order a barrage of testing. But as you know, this is, and when we get to the outcomes, you'll, you'll be reminded that this is a very, very serious disease. And we have medicines that help, but we must get to an, if there's an underlying disease that can be found and treated, we must get to it and we must um, treat it. So we have a very extensive workup. This is a slide just to make the point that it's a very extensive workup. Um, <clears throat> not for you to remember it, but certainly we start with a history and physical, chest x-ray, ECG, and echo is helpful. Ultimately, we're going to get to a cardiac catheterization and do vasodilator testing. We send labs to make sure there's no um, rheumatologic issues, um, hepatic issues, infections. We'll do a um, abdominal ultrasound to make sure there's no shunts um, in the portal system that, that can or portal pulmonary hypertension that can, can participate. We uh, usually do a CT angiogram. The adults tend to do VQ scans more often than we do, but you want to rule out uh, any kind of clots. Um, you want to rule out pulmonary venous disease and, and other things that we'll talk about. If there's any obstructive uh, uh, breathing problems, we need to assess that. So even if it's a clear cut uh, patient with a known disease, We'll always do a sleep study because we want to make sure that any OSA could contribute and we want to, um, that those things are certainly easier to treat than idiopathic pulmonary vascular disease. So we just want to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and anything that could be uh, contributing to the disease, we want to, we want to optimize. So hereditable or the familial type is, is an interesting expanding category. You know, every month another gene is, is found. Uh, this, is, this, this is probably the most relevant right now. By far and away, the most common familial gene is BMPR2, which is in TGF uh, superfamily. Uh, greater than 70% of their familial type is related to BMPR2. If you're a female with the BMPR2 mutation, you have about a 50% chance of getting the disease. If you're a male, it's about 20%. Um, so um, it's an important gene. Uh, many other important genes, the EIF2 AK4, has been associated with pulmonary venoocclusive disease or, or PCH, pulmonary capillary mangiomatosis, important because those which we'll talk about those things are not usually not made better by pulmonary vasodilators and often can make things worse. Um, SOC17 is interesting because even our patients with congenital heart disease, only subsets have de developed pulmonary vascular disease, and those that do, uh, subset seems to have mutations in SOC17. And I'll talk uh, briefly about TBX4 and FOXF1. TBX4 is small patella syndrome, which is emerging as the second most common uh, form, genetic form of pediatric or neonatal pulmonary vascular disease. And then FOXF1 is associated with alveolar capillary dysplasia, which obviously um, is important to, to diagnose because short of lung transplant, there's no, uh, it's a fatal disease. So obviously the importance of identifying genetic or syndromic associations are that they aid in identifying identify an etiology such as ACD or PVOD, uh, aid in identifying mechanisms of the disease. As we learn more about what these gene mutations are associated with, perhaps we could, uh, you know, look mechanistically and perhaps uh, come up with um, particular therapeutic targets. Aid in guiding treatment strategy. For example, we know that BMPR2 uh, patients do have more of aggressive disease than let's say an idiopath of that or primary that doesn't have BMPR2 mutation. So we may be much more aggressive with our treatment up front if they're a BMPR2 mutated uh, individual. And then ultimately, obviously, we, we need to do a better job and really have individualized therapeutic targets. Um, um, let me just make this point now. The way we treat patients is barbaric and somewhat embarrassing. Uh, you know, there's, as we'll get to, there's three types of, of therapies. Uh, 
Um, and right now, if they have mild disease, we give them one drug. If they have moderate disease, we give them two drugs. And if they got really bad disease, we give them three drugs. And it doesn't matter what the underlying etiology is, what the underlying pathobiology is, they all get treated the same. And obviously, we need, we need to get much, much better uh, at that. So PPHN, I just, I just wanted to, to, to talk briefly about it because as pulmonologists, you don't necessarily get called often for PPHN, but when PPHN is not going away, uh, you will often will get called. And this is a classic slide by A. Brudoff looking at the dramatic changes that occur at birth with a dramatic fall in pulmonary vascular resistance that's associated with an increase in pulmonary blood flow and a decrease in pulmonary artery pressure from the suprasystemic um, levels in the fetus to the postnatal form. And then as you know, PPHN is broadly defined as failure to transition from the fetal to the postnatal pulmonary circulation. I like to kind of think about it as three different ways, uh, maladaptation, maldevelopment, hypodevelopment, and then the irreversible forms. The maladaptation to me, would uh, I kind of simplify it by saying the, the vasculature itself is normal, but something's happened during the transition, whether it's a uh, RDS or pneumonia or MEC aspiration, but they don't adapt well. In other words, they remain acidotic and or hypoxemic, so they just don't undergo that normal fall. But since their pulmonary vasculature itself is normal, you can imagine that they respond well to supportive therapy, perhaps nitric oxide, et cetera. The maldevelopment is, um, well, we don't see as much anymore, but it was a classic clear x-ray where, um, the feeling is that this was an in utero stress event and their pulmonary vasculature is remodeled actually at the time of birth. And so they don't necessarily respond quite well initially, but this is the kids that need some more time, perhaps ECMO support until they uh, remodel in a positive way and then go on uh, to do well. So the classic one here would be maternal non-steroidal uh, use that causes ductal constriction. And in animal models, if you can constrict the duct, you can really cause significant pulmonary vascular remodeling within seven days. So that would be a classic one for that. And then the hypoplastic vasculature, as you know, the congenital diaphragmatic hernias, other hypo uh, uh, development disorders. And there, as you know, a lot of it is related to just hypo, how hypoplastic the lung and the vasculature really is. Then I'll talk very briefly uh, about the irreversible forms in a few minutes. So this, this is it right now, actually. So when persistent pulmonary hypertension persists, you may get called as a pulmonologist. And I think some of the, um, some of the things that we think about from a pH perspective are alveolar capillary dysplasia, which, which we'll talk about is associated with FOXF1, a pulmonary interstitial glycogenosis, which is kind of a premature um, um, development of the lung vasculature. And um, that's, that's a good one to think about because they, about 25% of them will respond well to steroids. And this can present a severe neonatal hyper, uh, pulmonary hypertension that requires ECMO to something very, um, you know, they need a little oxygen or something like that or anywhere in between. So at the spectrum of disease with what we call PIG is, is rather large. TDBX4, I'll talk about the surfactant disorders, which you guys know about much more than I do. It's usually not, excuse me, difficult to uh, sort through because they've got a terrible looking x-ray. And then pulmonary lymphangiectasis is, is obviously another irreversible form. The evaluations that we take on from a pH perspective or a CT angiogram, if there's an interstitial pattern that may make us think more about uh, PIG, um, uh, otherwise, and the, the, the lymph issues can sometimes be picked up there. Otherwise, it doesn't help us. Genetic testing will pick will help us with uh, alveolar capillary dysplasia and TBX. And then this is the one place where I think a lung biopsy can be helpful. So when it comes to non-neonatal pulmonary hypertension, whether someone's operable with congenital heart disease or not operable, or what drug to give or how aggressive to treat, let me just say flat out that lung biopsy is not helpful, okay? There is study after study showing that it is not helpful. Um, 
What it can be helpful for is if you to look for other other forms like pulmonary venal occlusive disease or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. But to to guide treatment, um, it's just not helpful because the the disease is patchy, and you you may not pick up a representative um, um, form. So ACD, as you know. Its classic presentation is refractory PPHN in neonatal, neonatal period. However, there are reports of atypical and later presentations, and we've seen kids present at three months of age. We've seen, we even saw a 10-year-old present and ended up having ACD. Uh, the typical course is that they're refractory to therapy. However, a transient response to therapy is not uncommon. We'll all get fooled, like all of a sudden the kid's doing better for a day or two, and then they fall apart again. That is not uncommon for alveolar capillary dysplasia. As you know, it's fatal without lung transplantation. There are reports, and we've, uh, we've managed kids on pulmonary vasodilators and, and uh, oxygen therapy for months, uh, but ultimately uh, they succumb unless they're transplanted. What can really help um, hone you into that this could be ACD and you should either get genetic testing or a biopsy is associated anomalies. Over 75% have GI associated anomalies. This could be a malrotation, it could be a small infalocele, whatever. They often have cardiac anomalies or your genital anomalies. So if you have a kid with refractory PPHN that happens to have another anomaly, you should really be concerned that this could be ACD. There's characteristic histology uh, that makes the diagnosis and 40 to 80% are associated with FOXF1. So if you can get your genetic testing back quickly, it could be helpful, but many places, including ours, that's not the case. And if it's, if it's uh, negative anyway, it still could be uh, ACD. So oftentimes uh, you need to go on to biopsy. FOXF1 is really, really fascinating. Um, it's associated with uh, embryonic lung development and um, it's again, 40 to 80% are associated with ACD. TDBX4 is really the one that I was, I was thinking of was the next slide, which is really a fascinating story. Uh, TBX4 disrupts, uh, loss of it disrupts hind limb and pelvic development, but more recently it's been shown that it disrupts the respiratory uh, system development and vascularization. So classically, uh, mutations of TBX4 is associated with small patella syndrome, which is seen in adults. But more recently, it's been described as an uh, emerging etiology of childhood pulmonary hypertension and uh, really severe neonatal pH with respiratory failure. This kind of gives you a timeline of the TBX4 story. It was found to be on chromosome 17 in 1996. Small patella syndrome was uh, discovered or described in 2002. 2013, it was shown to be associated with pulmonary arterial hypertension in neonates and children more so than adults. In 2016, it was shown to be associated with developmental lung disease. Here's the small patella syndrome. So we, when we see, you know, any, um, Neonatal, as a pH specialist, if we're consulted on a neonatal or a childhood pulmonary hypertension, we look at the parent's toes and we ask about knee or hip problems. Because in adults, it manifests as small patella syndrome, but it can manifest as neonatal or childhood pH in children. This is an interesting slide. It shows you, um, this is TBX in, in dark and BMPR2 in open. BMPR2 can present as pulmonary hypertension really at, at any age. But the TBX4, it's really, if you, if, if you don't present with pulmonary hypertension in childhood, generally it's not a big player in terms of hereditary uh, pulmonary hypertension presenting in adults. You get small patella syndrome, but the pulmonary hypertension that you see is all, almost all in childhood. It's an interesting uh, phenotype. Drug or Moving on to drug and toxin-induced, uh, let me just see how I'm doing for time. Okay, um, you know this this gained a lot of uh, press. The concept that uh, appetite suppressants like fenfen uh, were associated with pulmonary hypertension, and that's why it was pulled off the market. Um, we know that 
this is likely I need to change this. This is definite methamphetamines and some other uh, toxins are associated with pulmonary hypertension. Estrogen containing contraceptions are unlikely to, um, to be a sole etiology of pulmonary hypertension, but we certainly do not, um, they, because of their procoagulant um, effects, we, we do not have our, our uh, female patients utilize estrogen containing oral contraceptions, but it doesn't by itself cause pulmonary hypertension. So let's just talk about pulmonary venous occlusive disease and pulmonary, or, and or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. This is the problem with this. This is kind of a venual issue. So it's a post-capillary issue. And therefore, pulmonary vasodilators can make things worse. This is a patient that we unfortunately had when we started our program early on. <coughs> this was reactivity testing in the cath lab. So this was the patient before just got you know, 10 minutes of nitric oxide and 100% oxygen. She went on to have a respiratory and then a cardiac arrest, got resuscitated and actually is getting married. Well, her marriage was postponed because of COVID after a lung transplantation um, many, many years ago, but she's doing quite well. But this can really uh, be rather dramatic. It can obviously be much more subtle than this as well. So we always get a CT angiogram on any patient that we're working on for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, usually prior to taking her to the cath lab or him to the cath lab, because we wanna make sure it's safe uh, to give pulmonary vasodilators. And this is a diagnosis that a good chest radiologist can make, uh, evidence of pulmonary venous occlusive disease. Very important to rule in or rule out. CTEF is also an important one because it can be treated, right? It's a form not to be missed. Um, adults use, use VQ stands and more often than we do. We tend to use a CT angiogram. And um, obviously, anticoagulation is a, th is a therapy, but if the clot is, is significant, it can be surgically removed. And this is a picture of uh, basically the clot that was re resulted in a cast of the pulmonary vasculature. Congenital heart disease is a, is a big subpopulation of the patients. There's two major forms, those that result in increased pulmonary blood flow and pressure, and those that are the left-sided heart disease, those with increased pulmonary venous pressure, that would be a group two. What's interesting about this is we know the inciting event and we know the natural history, right? It seems to be pressure and flow to the pulmonary vasculature, these abnormal mechanical forces result in endothelial injury and subsequent vascular remodeling. And those with a direct pressure head, like a trunk is arteriosus or an AV canal, have 100% incidence of developing pulmonary hypertension if they're not repaired. And they do so much earlier than, for example, an atrial septal defect, where they'll only develop pulmonary hypertension without surgery in 10 to 20%. And if they do, it's really in the third or fourth decade of life. So that would be flow alone without a direct pressure head these have direct pressure heads. And then I'm gonna pass over this. This is just a different morphology for congenital heart disease. But this is a nice cartoon to go over the vascular remodeling. Again, this is a picture of, um, of a VSD. Stacey Oblenis first made this. Uh, my uh, colleague Ian Adetia stole it from Stacy with permission. And then I stole this from Ian with permission. But here's a picture of the VSD. The red here is muscle. And the normal postnatal phenotype is the muscle layer is quite thin and it's very proximal. And the first thing that you see is, as we talked about, is medial hypertrophy, where the muscle gets thickened. And then the next thing you see is abnormal extension down to the periphery. And then as you get thrombi and um, you get loss of the small arterioles and so-called pruning of the pulmonary vasculature. So much, be, much best characterized with congenital heart disease. And then as you know, as the pulmonary vascular resistance begins to equal or sus, exceed the systemic vascular resistance, that hole that was going all left to right before is now either bi-directional or becomes right to left. And that's known as the Eisenmenger syndrome. So let's get to the, I have about 15 minutes left. 
10 minutes left. Let's get to the treatments. The th all the path we have many path treatments now, but it's all three pathways. It's it's augmenting the nitric oxide pathway, which is shown to be deficient in pulmonary vascular disease. It's augmenting the prostacyclin pathway, which has been shown to be deficient in pulmonary vascular disease. And it's uh, blocking the endothelin pathway, which has been shown to be upregulated in pulmonary vascular disease. So nitric oxide uh, vasodilates the pulmonary vasculature by activating cyclic GMP and it inhibits smooth muscle cell proliferation. Prostacyclin does the same thing by increasing intracellular cyclic AMP. This is GMP, this is AMP. And endothelin does the opposite. It um, causes vasoconstriction and promotes smooth muscle cell um, proliferation. So if you look at the FDA approval timeline of pH therapies, you can see that we've come a long way before 1995. It was calcium channel blockers, uh, anticoagulation, digoxin, and diuretics. And then Folan or Epoprostenol started in 1995, which became re really still the prostacyclines are the mainstay of therapy. In 1999, just short of 2000, was inhaled nitric oxide. And that's circled, and nisposantin is circled, and endothelin receptor antagonists, because right now these are the only ones that really are approved uh, for pediatric use, but we use all of them. And we'll go through some of these very, very quickly. So here's a nitric oxide pathway. Uh, in the acute setting, as you know, we give it inhalationally, and we use it during cardiac catheterization for reactivity testing. Orally, we break down the, the um, we block the breakdown of cyclic GMP by blocking PD5, and that can be given with sildenafil, which is uh, three times a day, but there's a suspension, so you can give it to kids that can't swallow pills, or you can give once a day to dalafil, but it's a pill, so we switch them over um, when they're a little older. You can give riosiquat, which is soluble guanoid cyclase stimulator. Um, so nitric oxide increases cyclic GMP by activating soluble guanoid cyclase. Um, we don't use this very much in um, children. It is, was studied and approved for CTEF. So the endothelin pathway, the way we uh, block it is by blocking the receptors. Um, Bostantin was the first one made. It can be a pill or a suspension. Um, the thing about it is there's about a 5% incidence of increased liver enzymes, so, and there's some anemia and some edema associated with it. So we have to follow monthly AST and ALT and do a CBC every three months. So there are, you are committing to monthly blood draws. Ambrosantin or Lateris is once a day, Bosantin is twice a day. It's a pill. It is, um, <clears throat> the uh, liver enzyme abnormality is much, much less. So we only do every uh, three months, really. We do monthly initially, then every three months liver enzymes, but it's once a day versus twice a day. Massey 1010 is, an, is a newer, um, even more selective one with the less liver enzyme abnormalities. And right now there's no blood drawing monitoring for Massey. Um, <clears throat> there is a current uh, study that we're all part of in Massey in, in, in children looking at dosing safety and efficacy. Prostacyclin, as I said, were really the mainstay. You have epoprostenol, which is full in, which is given IV, or you can give it in, inhalationally. Tripoprostenol, which really was a game changer for the pediatric world. It's IV, it can be given IV as well, but its half-life is about two to three hours as opposed to full in, which half-life is in minutes. And, and full in is, um, not stable at room temperature, so they have to wear an ice pack. And the lead tree is more stable in room, t in room temperature. But the problem with these things are they're, they're short half-life. So first of all, they're very, very potent. Any kind of bolus or anything uh, can cause se severe hypotension. But you know, patients would report just changing the syringe, they'd become short of breath because um, it's that short acting. Chaprostanol gives you about 30 to 45 minutes if there's a discontinuation of the infusion. It can be given IV, can be given inhaled by Tegeso. Most importantly, it's given, can be given subcutaneously like an insulin infusion 
and overwhelmingly, you know, we try subcutaneous first. Um, and if they can tolerate the site pain, it's obviously much better than IV where you don't need a central line and you have less risk of, of infection. Iloprost is an inhalational. We use it a lot in the acute setting with nitric oxide. It's another why some, of, some patients are responsive to prostacyclin inhalation. The oral troposinol or, or renatram is really in the pediatric trial was not that great in the sense that there was a lot of GI side effects. It's hard for these kids to tolerate it. Uh, the selexapeg, which is an oral receptor analog, so it's different than these. These are all prostanoids. This is a receptor um, ag agonist. The, the data is very impressive with selexapeg. It's never going to um, replace continuous, but it's not a, it's not a bad trade-off. And for that, you know, in terms of quality of life, et cetera, um, changing these kids over to a, an oral process cycling could be very significant. So in terms of outcomes, there's very limited information. Um, the historical data for untreated pediatric pH, the average time to de death after diagnosis was 10 months. This was prior to drug therapy. Uh, UK single s s uh, referral center survival was 89, 84, and 75. Uh, one, three, and five years. Uh, U.S. was um, 75, five year for idiopathic and 71 for congenital heart disease. Um, this is a little more recent data. The really, the only drug that we have really long-term survival data is, uh, is epoprostanol or Flolan. All the rest are, you know, just your classic four-month studies and do they walk more and feel better. Um, but here you can see in terms of, again, old data, but that IV flow in across the cycling does improve outcomes. Again, prior to 90, 1995, median survival in adults was 2.8 years. Median mean five-year survival was less than 40%. And in pediatrics, the average time from diagnosis to death was around 10 months. Um, this is some of the survival data. These are old data from the 1990s, different, um, different studies. This is prior to our new therapies. And I hope you can appreciate, although we have a long way to go, these are newer studies with treatment. You can appreciate that their survival is significantly, significantly better. So just to wrap up, I think what we can say is Neonatal and childhood pulmonary hypertension is a spectrum of disease with diverse pathobiology. Right now, it's like saying, you know, you have pulmonary hypertension and we're going to give you this drug for it. It's like saying you have cancer, so we're going to give you this drug for it. Treating cancer is all as if it was all one disease. Treating the 70 year old with prostate cancer and the 40 year old woman with breast cancer, the same. It's barbaric, <clears throat> it's primitive and we need to do a better job than that. <clears throat> Understanding the role of endothelial dysfunction has led to therapeutic targets, right? So all endothelin, prostacyclin, nitric oxide, they're all endothelial-based uh, targeting. However, you know, there's a lot going on in smooth muscle layer, which can be targeted. There's a lot going on with the right ventricle, which can be targeted. So even though endothelial-based uh, therapies have been game changers, there's no question. They live longer, they feel much better, and our much more aggressive upfront approach. We don't know how long uh, we can go before they need transplant, but they're doing quite well. But identification of the spectrum of mechanisms related to different forms of pulmonary hypertension may identify new therapeutic targets and guide individual therapies. And that's, that's where we have to go. And I hope that genetic uh, insights will, will get us there uh, quickly. And I think with that, I'll stop and leave, uh, leave some time for questions. Great, thanks Jeff, that was uh, awesome. Please type your questions into the chat box and then um, I'll read them. Um, that would be very helpful. Uh, Jeff, I, I uh, comment and then a question. Uh, you know, I think back uh, in my own career uh, on the last point that you just made, 
and what we used to do for pulmonary hypertension and what we do now, we've come a long way, but clearly we have a long way to go. And I just think yeah. 20 years now, people are going to look back and go, you used to do what? <laughs> um, but uh, my question is, is something that you started off very early about the 16-year-old who comes in who's been misdiagnosed as asthma. <clears throat> so one of the challenges for pediatric pulmonologists is you get – a lot of referrals of teenagers with no previous history of um, exercise uh, intolerance, and they come in, someone's thought of asthma, and, it, and typically it's not asthma, or it, perhaps it was, it was just unrecognized um, earlier. It's oftentimes vocal cord dysfunction or anxiety issues manifesting. So how do we sort out um, what are the red flags in your mind where we should think about pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary vascular disease? Pardon me. I'm still old. Um, yep. These kids in, and then how would you start screening for them? Right. We're not going to start referring all these kids for cardiac chaos. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so what are the red flags where, where our antenna should raise? And then how would you, uh, uh, look into it? That's a great question. So I would say, <clears throat> first of all, that f for many of these kids, even before they get to you, there's probably been a long history of them not kind of keeping up with other uh, with siblings or other kids, um, or they're, they're the lazy one in the family. And um, so I think that that's, that's something to clue you in. I mean, you know, I've, most of the kids that we see have not been treated by by or seen by pulmonologists, but treated for reactive airway disease to the point where, as I said, that they're excused from gym, but they've never had such a bad exacerbation that they end up in the ED, you know? Um, so I think that's kind of a classic story. Obviously, if they have any signs of right heart failure, if, there's a, if their liver is down, if they've got some pulmonary edema, I mean, uh, um, leg edema, oftentimes they don't, though, then that would be a clue. If you can pick up a a loud second heart sound, that is obviously important. I mean, you know, and it's easy for me to say because I see them all, you know, they've already, I know that they have uh, pulmonary hypertension, so. Uh, but, um, and then, you know, what I would say is the best screening is echo, is refer them for echo if there's if things around, about this history that don't feel right. And obviously if there's any kind of family history. Um, and but you can certainly do an EKG, and if you know if there's signs of right atrial, right ventricular enlargement, then by all means they need to be seen by a cardiologist. I don't think an EKG by itself is a great screening tool. The by far and away the best is echo. But if there's some suspicion of it, you know, that it just doesn't seem right, it just doesn't seem like asthma, but the kid's got symptoms, then I would probably send them to a cardiologist for an echo. I don't think that that's overkill. Okay, great. Very helpful. It's great to know. Uh, I think there's a couple questions here in the chat box. Do you want to read them or you want me to read them? Or? Oh, let me see how to do this. This is a, um, okay. How early can we start considering? So am Ambrosentin is a, uh, is a pill. So, um, as, as long as they can swallow a pill, so what we will do is we'll, we'll tell the parents to start having them try to swallow the mini M&Ms, you know, because that's the size of the pill. And once they can reliably do that, then we, we switch them over to, to Ambrosantin. We'll still generally get, you know, LFTs for a month or two, you know, every month for a couple of months just to make sure that we're, you know, that it's safe. And then we back off to every three months, which makes a, a big difference. Okay, as a pediatric pulmonologist, is there anything you wish you could change in terms of how NICU attendings typically manage pulmonary <laughs> hypertension? Be careful where you step in that one. Yeah, I'm going to stay, stay away from that one. But um, I, I think, no, you know, I'm going to go the other way, actually. You know, we get called a lot as a pulmonary hypertension service for straightforward PPHN. And um, I, I think that should be really in the neonatal um, realm. Um, I think it's a good, good question of like when, when, when PPHN persists and when is that, you know, 
in our original inhaled NO studies, most kids were able to wean off NO by a few days of life, but but everyone was off by eight. So is it, you know, after a week? When is that? No one really knows. But then I think they've got to call you guys in because it can be something a bit more serious. Um, the other thing is though, I do think I, I do think it needs to be managed more from a cardiovascular standpoint. For example, putting them on PGE1 to main ductal patency to unload the RV, I think is a great strategy. Um, and it's being done more and more. But it's one of these things where it's not, it wasn't done that much because neonate, neonatologists are in a silo, cardiologists are in a silo, pulmonologists are in a silo. And that's been part of the problem with the pulmonary vascular world. You know, and it wasn't until pulmonologists and cardiologists and ICU doctors all started meeting together and talking together. And they all have different, different things they bring to the table. And it's all very, very helpful. Um, I think that's, that's really, and I think that's improved care. So for neonates with pulmonary hypertension, at which point do you get a genetic panel? Any specific red flags or any specific, yeah. So there are genetic panels for pulmonary hypertension. If you're talking about neonates, you know, their surfactant panel is, may not be sufficient. You've got to make sure that you've got FOXF1 and TBX4 as part of your panel because those, and TBX4 is really emerging. The more you look for it, the more it's there. Um, it's a good question, what, at what point? I think, you know, I, I think probably, and I get this call all the time, because you know that many of them could just, could be, be a delayed transition for a variety of different reasons, right? And so you don't want to be working up all these kids, particularly doing a biopsy uh, when they just have PPHN. But I would say, I would start thinking about it if, if they're still struggling a week later. Um, after a week, I would worry about it. Maybe 10 days is when I'd start really. I, I, well, I think in a week, you can certainly do a CT angiogram to see if there's an interstitial um, pattern there that's relatively benign. Um, probably, you know, send off a genetic panel. It may wait, wait longer in terms of, you know, do, being some, doing something more invasive like a lung biopsy. But before that, I would take them to cardiac catheterization to make sure we're not missing anything before you took them for a lung biopsy. Okay, how, how do you approach children with pulmonary hypertension severe enough that they're determined to need therapy, but aren't stable enough for cath? I know data from cath are important for outcomes as well. Yeah, so we will, we will rarely, if, um, if we have the opportunity to do a cath prior to initiating therapy, well, that's what we will do. It is a very rare patient where we feel like they're too unstable to do cath. Now, having said that, we're lucky enough to have one of our pH cardiologists is, does all our caths. Um, so, you know, they, they get great data and they know exactly, you know, what to do and how to, how to do it. As or more importantly, we have a, a cardiac anesthesia team that does all our pH caths. And they tend not to intubate them if they're not intubate them and they, and they use a lot of dextominate and, and, and you know, we haven't had a lot of morbidity, thank goodness, with cardiac catheterization. So I think it really depends on your local environment, the local comfort level and the local expertise. Um, I do think if you can get data prior to therapy, that that, that is very helpful. Um, Any other questions? Those are great questions so far. I really appreciate the engagement. I, I have to say as a comment, Jeff, these, these kids in my career have been the kids that have made me the most ner nervous. Uh, you appropriately know. so, appropriately yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, that was great. Um, Jeff, thank you so much. I love that talk because it's the area that I that I feel least comfortable with. So it's always great to hear and you do such an excellent job. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. There are no more questions. Uh, we can go ahead and release you and uh, appreciate it uh, again. And we'll turn it over to McGee Lee. Thanks a lot, Jeff.